Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President Warden, uh, dear Dean Smith, dear Brett, Director, uh, dear friends. First, I want to express my deep uh, thanks for invitation and for honor to speak here at the opening of BYU uh, International Symposium, which became quite traditional, famous, and I think also very constructive and influential, not only in the academic community. I personally want to thank Cole Durham uh, and his uh, collaborators and the medicines who helped me very um, openly uh, when I recently got seriously ill. This was really a show of very brotherly assistance or solidarity. Thank you again and publicly. Religion, religious freedom, and changing world. My colleague, my friend Andres Shayo, Shayo will speak more on legal and constitutional perspectives, dynamics in this area. I will focus more on political uh, dimensions and social dimensions. Ladies and gentlemen, who does not understand religion, and especially abuse of religion, cannot understand what's going on in today's world. Religion is the, with the mankind since the beginning of history. It connects man with his beliefs, transcendency, but also relates and unites. In Latin term, religare, unites into community into faith community. According to recent Pew Research Center figures, 84% of the world population claim religious affiliation. This is overwhelming majority. On all continent in Europe, in spite of the perceived secularization according to the, the latest uh, Eurobarometer statistics on the re religiosity, uh, we can say that majority of European citizens feels an affiliation to a religion or a faith. So we can really say it's really a significant phenomenon in 21st century. It is in eradicable condition of human lives and human society, providing a set of values by which many individuals and communities govern themselves. At the European Union level, this is recognized even in the Treaty on Functioning of the European Union, which mandates a regular dialogue between the European Union and churches, religious and associations and communities, as well as philosophical and non-confessional organizations. Many voices say that religion is back in our globalized world. Religion is back with new forms and in new ways, affected by global changes, surfing social media and di digitalization. We observe new powerful trends cutting across religion as fundamentalism, spiritualism, charismatic movements. New lenses, new concepts are needed to understand this complexity. So, a few words. Uh, and messages about four, as we say, in European and more and more in international terms, uh, in a changing world. Four, freedom of religion or belief. It's a litmus test of all human rights, because it's freedom of thought, conscience, religion, conviction. It speaks directly about dignity of human person, which is born free. It, it is expansive right because it speaks about other rights as well. It's linked to right to assembly, right to association, right to expression. It covers also non-believers and conversion. It is implemented individually or and collectively. Respect of human rights is not possible without respecting freedom of religion or belief. All dictators 
All terrorists are happy when FORB is restricted or non-existing. Four most inhumane dictators in the 20th century bloodily oppressed and violated FORB. It was Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, and Pol Pot. Unfortunately, in the FORB community, we are getting used to daily bad news. FORB is under pressure. Indicators are worsening. We all witness tragedies, even genocides, around us. We have global statistics showing a gloomy picture. Let me share you a reminder of few. Two years ago, because this is the latest data, 40% of countries had high or very high level of restrictions on freedom of religion. But these countries represent 74% of global population, three quarters of mankind with high restrictions on FORB. The percentage of countries with high or very high levels of social hostilities increased two years ago from 23% to 27%. 105 countries, majority in the world, experienced widespread government harassment of religious groups. Government use of force against religious groups increased as well in last years. There is also a new growing trend of non-state actors, very violent, oppressive in numbers and in influence. I will mention Taliban, so-called Islamic State, Al-Nusra, Boko Haram, and there are many others. We can read more precise figures and reports from United Nations, European Union, from European Parliament Intergroup on FORB, from Aid to Church in Need, from Open Doors, Human Rights Without Frontiers, US Commission on uh, International Religious Freedom, and many organizations. Critical is situation on uh, religious freedom in many regions, in many countries, like North Korea, Pakistan, Somalia, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Myanmar, there are new concerns also in Russia through the ban of Jehovah Witnesses. So all continents could be mentioned and in individual cases or tendencies. Scale of these oppressions go from intolerance through discrimination to persecution up to genocide. This term I use openly and critically because it's also reality mentioned by many institutions in today's world. The recent report of UN rapporteur on FORB draws attention on following. Almost half of countries have laws penalizing blasphemy, apostasy, or defamation of religion. In 22 countries, there is still use of death penalty for uh, apostasy. In at least 13 countries, capital punishment for atheists. Non-believers are more and more under oppression. Unfortunately, at the same time, within United Nations Human Rights uh, Universal Periodic Review process, only 2.5% of adopted recommendations uh, deal with the four violations. Recently, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom published study on blasphemy laws in 71 countries. Majority of laws contain moderately to clearly uneven criminal punishments ranging from prison sentences, lashings, forced labor to death penalty. Blasphemy laws are vaguely worded and increasingly misused for political reasons. So what are the main messages of this input? or introductory part. First, freedom of religion or belief situation in the world is critical in many parts of the world. And secondly, trends are worrying. Trends are negative. Moreover, migration, whether voluntary or for forced migration, has reached record high numbers uh, recently, 245 million people is on the move. 
65 million people as forced on uh, their move for new destinations. World is really, really changing. Recently, one professor in Rome mentioned, time comes to think about the need of religious climate change. Religious climate change. Situation is very worrying, trends are negative, so either we are aware and do something, or then we face consequences. If we want to improve global situation and global trends, we need to embrace credible change, to embrace and to overcome um, what is ignorance and illiteracy, prejudices, divisions, and work for peace, justice, sustainable development, and human dignity for all and everywhere. There are also some good news. For example, Marrakesh Declaration adopted last year a very important list of principles for behavior of majorities versus minorities in uh, Muslim societies. These declarations, like Marrakesh or Rabat uh, or um, Beirut, need to be implemented. Some Gulf countries make steps towards religious plurality and gender equality. For example, Saudi Arabia uh, now announced women may become car drivers. So simple, but important for reality, for daily lives, for equality. In Tunisia, women are allowed to marry non-Muslims, to marry out of state religion. So changing world, is it a th threat or is it a, a promise? It depends. With worrying trends, of course, we, share, we will have more and more um, problems and victims of the situation. But we have a say on this. My father and my grandfather would love to have our, my crisis, difficult time of our um, discussions. The rate of our responsibility depends on the rate of our influence. As citizens, professors, policymakers, judges, the rate of our responsibility depends on the rate of our influence individually and collectively. This is the departure point. So we can make a difference. We have influence. We can turn down negative, negative tendencies. We should at least do utmost for a better world, be more mature in our responsibilities. So what to do? Flying here with Delta, I've seen movie Promise. I think some of you or many of you have seen this. It is on Armenian mass atrocities in 1915-1916. Last year, last year, 2016, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, European Parliament, United States Congress, United Kingdom and Australian Parliaments, adopted strong, clear, unequivocal resolutions on the situation in the Middle East, namely on the territories under ISIS dominance in Iraq and Syria, naming it, it as a genocide committed by ISIS militants. I mention it because decades ago our predecessors promised never again in facing such inhumanities. This was our predecessor's promise and remains our commitment under international law and the national laws. We failed. We failed again and again and again. In Europe, Balkans, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Middle East. We failed in all three P principles or P commitments to the persecuted people to prevent, to protect, and to punish. To prevent from mass atrocities, to protect victims of such situations, 
and to punish perpetrators. Iraq, Iraqi government in May last year, in May last year, count number of months since May last year, asked in the Security Council for the international team to investigate ISIS crimes on the territory of Iraq. It was adopted only now, more than a week ago, in New York. May take time, may take years, decades, but justice, justice is always important. Peace is fruit of justice. Peace, peace is fruit of justice, locally and globally. War crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide accuse dictators and totalitarian regimes, but in some way, in some way, also entire international community, at least from inefficiency, from slow or no action whatsoever. Ladies and gentlemen, evil has strong, very influential allies, well placed everywhere, in politics, in academia, in society, in religious groups, on top and grassroots levels both. We all know them very well. Three evil allies are decisive. Ignorance, indifference, and fear. Ignorance, when we don't know. Indifference, if we don't care. And fear, if we are scared, afraid, to say something or to do something on behalf of voiceless or defenseless people in favor of truth, justice, and humanity. Ignorance, indifference, and fear are interrelated. They are like siblings. And they hate courage, education, and responsibility. So what to do? And here I would like to focus on my final points. First, we should not fail again to deliver on our promises, on our commitments, on our duties, responsibilities, to abandon again the persecuted, accept impunity of criminals. Human rights will not work without such with such attitudes, or with, will not work without attitudes, which means commitments, without international community, mature citizenship, and institutions of law enforcement on duty. Because each right has also duty. It can work only in balanced situation. Then we need to understand that religion is part of solution, and religious freedom or FORP is a great important instrument for positive change. It's not a question, it's not a problem, it's the answer. I'm convinced, for example, that with credible contribution of faith-based actors, we cannot fulfill objectives of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030 without faith-based actors and their contribution. SDGs will remain on paper. Therefore, we support religious dimension, very innovative approach with G20 side events. That is why we established after 25 years, after 25 year tradition, Lorenzo Natali Media Prize in European Union for Forbes journalism, whether professional or amateur, to raise awareness, to show examples, to motivate, to inspire. When I speak about religious freedom, I always mean responsible, mature freedom, because freedom without responsibility cannot work, cannot exist. Like rights are not possible without duties. I will now move in the field of a bit of mentality and morals, but also speak for curricular, educational, legal, political thinking and reforms. First, about common good. Secondly, about responsibility of political and religious leaders. And thirdly, about the importance of fair, secular state. I think common good is frequently forgotten, abandoned, underestimated value, 
very important principle for European integration, for European future, but I mean also international and global future and cooperation. I think common good should be promoted instead of superiority or supremacy, because it speaks about the win-win policy instead of winner takes all or zero-sum game. When we see common good, we usually find common ground, then we find common interests, then we find common solutions, even, even common victories, common future. These are fruits of common good. Mentality of superiority, superiority means my nation first, my country first, my club first, or religion, my race, my tribe, tend to lead to policy of supremacy. And in worst case, even to ideology of supremacy. From ideology, there is a very shortcut, short way to prejudices, unequal treatment, hatred, and even violence. Historia magistra vitae est. Identity has a value only when there is somebody different. Within uniformity, what kind of identities are important? Numbers? Diversity is a defining principle for entire humanity, even within a family. Children are different from parents. We all are different, but we all are born equal in dignity and rights. We all are one mankind, and collectively, we are sometime, somewhere, a clear minority. Status or treatment of minorities is one of the objective criteria of majority culture and behavior and criterion of good governance. This is true also in relation to religious minorities. Four is intrinsic part of human dignity and common good. And human dignity is first fundamental value where all sincere, real humanists should meet together, whether they are religious or secular. We need to reiterate common space between religion and human rights. Shared origins, concepts, values, and goals. And global list of this reiteration has a name. It's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Secondly, from politics of identities to politics of responsibilities, or more nicely expressed, from language of ident on identities to ethics of responsibility. Interface dialogue, dialogue with religions is important. It must encompass several principles in order to bear fruits for respect and diversity. The first one is refusal of violence. Violence as instrument of solving the differences. Second, acceptance of religious freedom, including freedom to convert. And third is a separation of religion and politics, or religion and state power. European Union has no hesitation to protect and promote freedom of religion as it is well aware that faith leaders are, on their side, committed to respect the sovereignty of democratic political institutions. Institutionalized religion has no political ambitions in today's European societies, just as, in turn, political institutions uphold the duty to protect the rights of all religious communities. They know that defending their rights is an obligation of the state powers that is enshrined in the most of our European constitutions. And this is the first and most fundamental contribution religious communities can make to democracy, respecting the independence and sovereignty of democratic state institutions. But in turn, democratic rule of law also has to mean the protection of all fundamental rights, including religious freedom. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, I quote. They are endowed 
with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. This is the first article, the most important beginning of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It resonates fully with the very core of all major religious faiths. All human beings are endowed with dignity. They are born free and equal in dignity, which no human power can neither bestow nor withdraw. And human institutions, including political institutions, can only acknowledge and solemnly declare it. I want to state my conviction that the amalgamation of terrorism and religion is wrong, and no holy scripture or religious tradition should be held accountable for the horrible actions some fanatic and obscure militant groups or individuals perpetrate in the name of that religion. But words of political leaders don't hold the same authority as the public statements of faith leaders when they publicly denounce political violence perpetrated in the name of God. I just want to mention several of them which were very clear, active, and vocal on these matters, like Pope Francis, Grand Mufti Al-Taib of Al-Azhar, or Dalai Lama, and others on their levels. This is a shared responsibility, a goal we will only achieve if we work together. Religious leaders, policy makers, lawmakers, judges, academics, journalists, civil society activists. And the third is fair state. Fair state preserving peace, security, good governance for all. Such state is needed. As religions are moving, society is changing, we indeed need to learn how to deal with cultural, ethnic, and religious diversity how to build cohesive and respectful societies. We need to lear learn to live in diversity, not only to exist in diversity. Religious literacy is a must for a shared society, a necessary competence for good education, for mature citizenship, because uniformity and ignorance breeds intolerance. And from intolerance, there is a very short connection to radicalization and violent extremism. This we have to keep in mind, especially with our children and young generation. There are many inspiring examples of successful educational and youth initiatives aimed at de-radicalization. We embrace the world which is a living mosaic, not a melting pot. And society is a mosaic in small. In order to organize such living together, to realize, to implement diversity in unity, we need a state which is fair and just to all. It is civil or secular state instead of religious or ethnic. I was very happy this year in Iraq, in Erbil, and in Najaf, when I spoke to Grand Ayatollah al-Najafi, and then to, to Chaldean Patriarch Louis Rafael Sacco, and they used almost the same language, speaking about the future of Iraq, as a civil state, civil state based on citizenship, on equality for all citizens. The name of Iraq today and the situation there is still far from this ideal. But when religious leaders use this language and they drive their communities towards such solution, I think we can see it on the horizon of constitutional reforms. We need it. Iraq need it, needs that. Middle East needs that. In this respect, it's important to revisit the very idea of, of secularism and laicite, because secularism cannot become an ideology. It must not become an ideology. Secularism cannot mean re replacement of religions, but state openness for plurality. Fair secularism opens and organizes space for religion and belief. Unfair secularism closes the public space for religion. I add my voice to those responsible leaders 
and scholars who refuse divisive simplifications in our academic, political, and media discussions of unreconcilable differences between civilizations and logically of necessary future clash of civilizations. We do not need clash of civilizations, but definitely we need more civilization, more knowledge about and dialogue among cultures, religions, and civilizations, because there exists a potentially very risky clash, clash of ignorance, clash of ignorance. If we do not understand, if we do not know, and even are not interested to know the others. Therefore, I welcome BYU professional commitment on law and religion studies here and also in the world. I assisted to launch European Academy of Religion in Bologna this year. I support the International Consortium on Law and Religion Studies because I think they do a great job in the world on our con continents. I already mentioned welcoming remarks on Marrakesh Declaration and Beirut Declaration. Ladies and gentlemen, international community is determined to fight for freedom of religion. I think I can say it very clearly. This is European Union, this is United Nations, OSCE, International Parliamentarians Platform for Four, uh, Commonwealth Initiative on Four, Democratic Countries, NGOs, advocacy, civil society organizations. We are convinced that religion is in itself a force for good and knows that the wide majority of religious faithful are peace-loving, respectful of other people's rights and fundamental liberties. This is indeed the conviction of the European Union. We are major sponsors of four resolutions in the United Nations, New York, and Geneva negotiations. Behind the adoption of the European Union guidelines on four promotion in June 2013, and more recently, the reason behind my appointment as the first uh, special envoy for four outside of the European Union. In several member states, there are different representatives and observatories established to deal with four internationally. We in the European Union strongly believe that it is possible to turn the situation around. Yes, we are all well aware of the threats and risks our world is confronted with. We are not naive. We know that it will be a difficult fight as the enemies are now facing, we are now facing, are not the same previous generations had to engage with. Today, they don't show any respect for international law. They don't shy away from using humanitarian workers, in some cases even defenseless women and children as human shields. We are now facing a new kind of violent extremism who respects no law and has no regard for the very notion of humanity and does not hesitate to use terror and suicide bombing to kill innocent civilians as a means to achieve political goals. And this, is point, this point is key. Terrorists are not religious people. They abuse religion and abuse religious feelings. Theirs is a political struggle driven by the will for power and the urge to dominate others. And this is one of the main reasons why we are resolved to fight violent extremism and terrorism with all means at our disposal and at the same time committed to protect for, not either or, but to protect for as an instrument. We know that religion, meaning also institutionalized religion, has been a force for peace, democracy, and respect for human dignity over recent times in our continent and generally in the world. The world is indeed changing, and change brings with it also a worrying level of uncertainty, even conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, but there is one thing that does not change and should not change. Our shared commitment to upholding human dignity 
for all and everywhere and to protect fundamental human rights. And I thank you for all for your work and your cooperation in this field. Thank you very much.